we placed very complex machines on the top of huge vertical structures the size of a 34-story tall building. We proceed to light these explosives, and the whole structure, along with valuable contents, are shot up so high they end up in space or within our planet. We call these rocket launches, and we collectively as a species perform one of them around every two weeks, and we have been doing them for at least 40 years. Right now, at this very moment, there are six humans, just like you and me, currently traveling at seven kilometers per second. That is almost 16,000 miles per hour at 400 kilometers in altitude inside a pressurized box we call the International Space Station. All of this is incredibly exciting, of course, but it is also incredibly dangerous and crazy. Why would anybody do such a thing? We don't just perform these activities for the sake of proving the limits of humanity, but there's a fundamental benefit of why we're doing them. Being in space gives you an unparalleled perspective that allows you to look back down into your world in ways not achievable otherwise. Imagine being lost in a corn maze. I don't know how we'd get into that position, but if you were able to know what it looked like from above, everything would be so much easier. Well, satellites provide a similar vantage point. They know what everything looks like from the top because they're up there in space, looking back down to us all the time. This is very valuable information that allows us to solve problems. They, in fact, make a lot of aspects of our modern lives. For example, the GPS service you may have used to navigate here, the weather forecast you may have seen this morning, and the telecommunications we all love to use, the internet, telephone, radios, all of these things depend in one way or another in, by satellites. Machines we humans have sent into space. And then there's science. Scientific breakthroughs and discoveries in physics, astronomy, even biology, are very often oriented in spacecraft, like the Hubble Space Telescope and the International Space Station. Space exploration. We today have high resolution images of the planets and the moons of our solar system. We have even imaged planets on the habitable suns of stars older than our own sun, places where we might one day find life. We have placed humans and robots, too, on the surfaces of objects of our solar system, objects once considered to be gods by the ancient humans. Clearly, there's a fundamental benefit and advantage of being in space. This begs the question, why don't we go there more often? Well, it is stupidly expensive to go to space right now, that's why. And there's multiple reasons why going to space is expensive. First, there's the obvious one, like building a rocket the size of a building, filling it with explosives, and cryogenically cooling it tends to be a bit expensive. And it certainly doesn't help at all. That after we're done with the launch, we let the thing crash into the ocean and sink so we can go keep company to the Titanic. <laughs> but even though this whole rocket thing is expensive, this is not the real reason why going to space is expensive. After all, on average, rocket launches and their cost of that is only about 10% of the total cost of a space mission. So where is the rest of my money going? Space is expensive because we're stuck in a vicious cycle. And allow me to explain. We have a starting point where designing, constructing, and operating a space mission is expensive. Now, because a space mission is expensive, we can only afford so many of them, and there's a low number of space missions. Because there's a low number of space missions, when you get the opportunity to send something to space, you really, really want to make sure it works. After all, you may have been waiting for this opportunity for the last 20 years, something not unheard of in the industry. These proportionate resources are spent into guaranteeing the success of these missions. Redundancy upon redundancy, quality checks, background checks, and radiation hardening for all materials. All of these things cost money. They add up and in the end end up being the majority of the cost of the mission, leading us to more expensive missions. And this cycle repeats itself. Expensive mission leads to low number of missions whose success wants to be guaranteed no matter the cost, leading to more expensive missions. And we're stuck. Space is expensive because failure is not an option. But what if it was? What if we embrace the possibility of failure? What if we accepted and took risks? What if we were to break the cycle by constructing smaller missions whose success is not to be guaranteed? Now, I'm not trying to suggest we just build haphazardous missions that are prone to failure or that every mission should have risk. There are, of course, some missions where we should go for a higher cost to guarantee a lower risk, especially when humans, astronauts, are involved. But there's some cases where it is reasonable to take some risk. Imagine you're a planetary scientist who's studying the surface of Mars because you just love the rocks and the surface of Mars. And that's okay, there's people like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> traditionally, you will build one very expensive, state-of-the-art, beautiful rover that will go all the way to Mars and perform wonderful science for you. But what if for the same amount of money, you were to build two? Now, this is not like an information or some black magic, so obviously you will need to cut corners somewhere, and the system may be more prone to failure somewhere, leading to, say, a 75% chance of success for each rover. You still send the boat to Mars, and yes, one might fail, but you still get the other one. 
Maybe both fail, then you're out of luck. But what if the most likely scenario occurs and both of them succeed? Then we have just performed double the amount of science without a single pain increase in price. We can do more with less if we accept some risk. This is specifically what we were doing with CubeSats. Some engineers at Cal Poly in 1999, they came together and disagreed upon building very, very small satellites in the same form factor. They introduced what we know today as the CubeSat standard. And CubeSats come in various sizes. A one new CubeSat is a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter box, about the size of a tissue box. A 2U is a 10 by 10 by 20 centimeter box, and a 3U is a 10 by 10 by 30 centimeter box, just about the size of a loaf of bread. Here, I have a model of a 3 unit CubeSat. This is the actual size of the spacecraft. But just because you're born a box, doesn't mean you have to die a box. You can expand and deploy solar panels. These satellites are remarkably small, especially when you consider the fact that when we normally talk about satellites, we talk in terms of cars and school buses, not loaves of bread and tissue boxes. Satellites are not normally something you hold on the stage while talking. <laughs> so even though these satellites are so small, we can fit a lot of useful electronics into them. This is thanks to the fact that people want a smaller computer and a smaller iPhone every single year. The commercialization, the miniaturization of consumer electronics have left us with very, very powerful computers on very, very small packages. So why not take the computer in your cell phone and put it in a satellite? This is the point where a traditional aerospace engineer would say, stop right there. This is not going to work. But I'm not a traditional aerospace engineer. I can guarantee to you that utilizing this iPhone electronics in your satellite is much, much, much less expensive than utilizing the redundant, radiation-hardened, customized electronics of normal satellites. There's some risk to utilizing these electronics because they're more prone to failure in space. But this allows us to build spacecraft for a really low price and break the cycle. So I have built my spacecraft, my little CubeSat, and I'm ready to send it to space. What do I do? Well, I approach a launch provider and say, hey, launch provider, send this to space for me. The launch provider will say, OK, I'll send this to space for you. Just give me $165 million. <laughs> As an undergrad student, <laughs> this felt a little bit outside of my budget. So what do I do? I wait for another customer with more money to get a launch. And I don't have to wait long, because after all, launches happen every two weeks, right? So then I just grab my little CubeSat, and I strap it next to the rocket's engine belt, or whatever I can make it fit. I ask them for permission first, of course. <laughs> for the rocket, a three kilogram increment in mass due to the CubeSat makes absolutely no difference, since it may already be carrying a five ton satellite the size of a school bus. We are literally hitchhiking our way into space as secondary payloads, and we're just charging a convenience fee for it. This fee may be in the order of a couple hundred thousand dollars. And I know, it's still expensive. It's not to the point where everybody's gonna go tonight, build a CubeSat, and send it to space tomorrow. But this is a very significant reduction in price. One that opens the doors of the previously British Classic Space Club to more players. I'm talking about high risk science with the possibility of a high reward. Now imagine you're a lunar scientist who's studying the moon because you just love the rocks on the surface of the moon. And that's okay, there's people like that too. <laughs> well, we have orbiters right now orbiting the moon, just like this. Imagine this is the moon, this is the orbiter. They're doing so, they're doing fine science, really cool stuff. But if we were able to orbit the moon really, really close to it on a really low altitude orbit, we will be able to make some very astonishing measurements. But it doesn't matter how much you love the moon and its rocks. No scientist or engineer in their right mind is going to risk the spacecraft if it's such a low orbit because it might crash into the moon. And that's bad. <laughs> but what if you were using a CubeSat? Then send it onto a 10, even a five kilometer orbit, I don't care. We may have 10 or 20 more around the moon at the same time. This aspect of CubeSat has been utilized by a company called Planet. Planet is an Earth imaging company founded in 2010 with one mission and one mission only. They want to image the whole Earth every single day. And they're doing it. And the resulting images are not only beautiful, but they're highly valuable for agriculture, space and defense, and, and mapping. As a result, they're making a good bank out of selling these images. They have transitioned from being headquartered in a garage seven years ago to being the single entity with the most satellites around our planet right now. They have hundreds of three-unit CubeSats, just like that one, or within our planet. And they have hundreds more waiting for launch. They recently deployed a record stating 88 from a single launch. And yes, their individual satellites fail all the time. But when you have hundreds more waiting for launch and hundreds more on orbit, it doesn't matter. Now, I have to admit to you, 
I have said I love a good things about satellites, but about kids that's specific. But they're not the solution to every problem out there. We still need big space missions because we cannot have uh, we cannot share the Hubble Space Telescope um, into the size of a loaf of bread with current technology. But CubeSats are very useful for very specific, so solving very specific problems. For example, scientists in the city of Phoenix are trying to understand how the composition and the structure of our cities affects the urban heat islands. Human materials, materials like concrete and asphalt, they tend to retain the heat of the sun longer and far more than the surrounding natural materials like grass, dirt, and cacti. As a result, the air temperature and the surface temperature of the cities is increased. This, this is not good because Phoenix is already hot enough. So, <laughs> uh, this is a very valid scientific investigation, one to which many scientists dedicate their whole lives to worth studying. But for some reason or another, this may not attract sufficient attention to single-handedly justify the construction of a large Earth or survey mission. But it can justify a CubeSat. And that is specifically what I'm working on right now. Together with a team of around 60 other undergraduate students at Arizona State University, I'm building such a CubeSat we have named Phoenix. Phoenix will go to space, carry a thermal camera, and image these heat islands from over there. We wrote a proposal to NASA two years ago and received $200,000 to build this mission. That may seem like a large amount of money, because it is. <laughs> but it is a spare change compared to any other mission out there that is not a CubeSat. CubeSats, like Phoenix, allows us to train the scientists and engineers of the future. It allows the students like us not just to learn how to design a spacecraft on paper, but to actually build a real spacecraft that will go into real space. <laughs> the same where Apple has flown. This is huge because it doesn't matter how much we as a species, as a society, value education. Nobody's currently writing checks for undergraduate students like me to go build satellites, but they're doing so for CubeSats. And Phoenix, or CubeSat, is much more than just a CubeSat. It is an interdisciplinary effort with students from the School of Journalism, Design and the Arts, Sustainability Engineering, all of us getting valuable science get valuable experience that will make us better in our respective fields. All of us working in unison towards our single common goal. We aim to promote the importance of climate science. We aim to promote the importance of climate science and produce meaningful scientific information and share it with anybody, anywhere, so they can do a meaningful scientific analysis if they so desire. I and the rest of my team spend countless hours working on this mission. It is proof that our work can have a meaningful impact on the world. And all of this is thanks to something as small as a loaf of bread. Thank you.